Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Eiichiro Kuana, President and Founding Principal, Cook Pine Capital LLC and USJC Board Member. Good afternoon. Um, it is wonderful to see all of you enjoying your lunch conversations. And let's start our featured lunch event, which will elicit even more stimulating ideas. One of the many reasons why I joined the USJC Board of Directors uh, earlier this year is a key platform for USJC that focuses on climate and sustainability. As I've been deeply involved in supporting environmental, sustainability, and climate initiatives for over a decade. Therefore, I am particularly pleased to introduce our next speakers. Suzanne mentioned earlier our deep appreciation to Amazon for becoming our founding strategic partner of the USJC Climate and Sustainability Initiative. We'd like to welcome Amazon's Vice President for International Policy and Government Affairs, Ms. Susan Pointer, to tell us more about the company's support. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And after several years of travel and meeting restrictions, at a personal level, it's just so great to be back in Japan. I've really missed it. <laughs> Amazon itself has over 20 years of history in Japan, with over 11,000 employees located throughout the country. I'm grateful for this brief opportunity to thank the US-Japan Council for hosting this important conference and very timely discussion. And also to everyone in the room, from our partners and leaders in government, to all of the local and global companies and non-governmental organizations, for your efforts individually and collectively to address the climate crisis in particular, one of the biggest challenges of our time. We're humbled to participate and partner with you all. We all know that the climate challenges won't be solved by governments, the private sector, or NGOs in isolation. Nor will it be solved in Japan or in the US alone. It's going to take all of us working in concert, sharing ambition and expertise which is why events like this one and organizations like the US Japan Council are just so important, convening a wide range of stakeholders to share knowledge and best practices and providing a genuine opportunity to think big together. I saw that in practice myself yesterday during uh, the USJC Sustainability Roundtable event, an event which we were honored to support and which Suzanne mentioned earlier. At Amazon, we seek to bring the same tenacity that we use to invent and solve problems for our customers to tackling climate and sustainability challenges. The journey to become more sustainable is not simple or straightforward for any organization, and that's true for Amazon also. We have a multifaceted business that operates logistics, packaging, facilities, data centers. We certainly didn't have all the answers when we started working on this, and we still do not have today. But that's OK. In fact, that is all the more reason to embrace the challenge, act with urgency, and hold ourselves accountable, including publicly, to ambitious targets, targets from which we can work backwards on solutions and on detail. In that spirit, we supercharged our own efforts back in 2019 
when alongside an organization called Global Optimis Optimism, we co-founded the Climate Pledge. And as the pledge's first signatory, we made a public commitment to achieving net zero carbon across our business by 2040, 10 years ahead of the Paris Agreement targets. But we, op we also openly invited others to join us in the pledge. And I'm delighted that there are now some 375 businesses and organizations across 54 industries and 34 countries that have signed the pledge alongside Amazon. It's still early days for the climate pledge here in Japan, and I'd humbly and respectfully invite fellow business leaders to take the opportunity to find out more about the pledge, to talk to us, and perhaps even join us on this important journey. We know that when it comes to tackling climate change, we are so much stronger together. Climate Pledge signatories have the benefit of learning from and partnering with each other and have opportunities to send strong collective signals to the market about our demand side, clean energy and procurement needs. For example, many Pledge signatories came together recently for Climate Week in New York. I was there, held alongside the UN General Assembly meetings. We are actively, of course, decarbonizing our own business. We have nearly 400 renewable energy projects in operations across the globe, from wind and solar farms to rooftop solar, helping us already reach 85% renewable energy across our business with more potential to unlock. Amazon is in fact now the world's largest corporate purchaser of renewable energy. We are electrifying our parcel delivery fleet and recently made an order for 100,000 new electric delivery vehicles. We also work closely and actively with private and public sector partners and with all levels of government across the globe to respectfully and thoughtfully share experience and viewpoints on how smart policymaking can help unleash, enable, and facilitate rapid and scalable deployment of renewables and zero emission vehicles. In Japan, for example, we are focused on availability and affordability of renewable energy at scale and on simplicity in the procurement process. Forums like today's are a critical part of policy thought leadership and of advancing suggestions that help us all move forward as quickly as possible in an optimally sustainable way. And in that, I want to extend my sincere appreciation to the Japanese government and ministry officials for the very open and constructive dialogue that we have encountered and enjoyed. Earlier in 2022, the US-Japan Council and Amazon launched, as was mentioned, a climate and sustainability initiative to help provide real-time insights and support for our shared climate efforts across the US and Japan. And as I mentioned earlier, just yesterday, this climate and sustainability initiative held the first of what we hope will be many high-level sustainability roundtables, bringing together government representatives and executives from leading companies from across the US and Japan to promote learning, ambition, and action. We're proud to Amazon of our commitments and efforts to date. However, we also recognize that there is a long and interesting road ahead of us, filled, I hope, with aspiration, education, innovation, and partnership. Our everyday actions to deliver progress against our climate goals are in service of achieving long-term systemic change that improves the well-being of our customers, of our employees, of our communities, and indeed the planet. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this event. It's a fantastic event, a fantastic organization, and I'm really excited about, about what we can achieve together going forward. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Susan, and to Amazon for your incredible leadership on, uh, uh, on starting the Climate Pledge and creating a real high hurdle for all of us to reach, uh, and it's something that we really must do, so thank you very much. Uh, as Susan uh, mentioned earlier, thanks to Amazon support, USJC convened an in-person sustainability roundtable, uh, which featured inspiring presentations and conversation among leaders in the US and Japan on the topic of sustainability. Today, we are fortunate to hear from two global sustainability leaders from Toyota and American Airlines, companies that are deeply committed to tackling climate change. To guide us through, the discussion is USJC Council Leader and Los Angeles Station KABC-TV news anchor, Mr. David Ono. David, we turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's, it's great to be here, and we are going to cover a lot of ground in the next half hour. Um, I think climate has come up quite a bit throughout this conference, and I love that, right? Because it's, it's obviously, it's, it's one of our, if not, it's probably the most difficult thing that we are dealing with as a global society. And I'm sure you're all stressed about it, we're stressed about it. I have two very, very intelligent people with me today to, to get the discussion going. And they're gonna put this on a level that's gonna give you a decent amount of understanding, uh, especially when it comes to how you live your own life, what you drive, what you think about when it comes to flying, et cetera. So let's get right to it. First of all, um, Dr. Gil Pratt, uh, it's, it's nice to have you here. Chief Scientist and Executive Fellow for Research Toyota Motor Corporation. Um, he's a founding Chief Executive Officer of Toyota Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Pratt helps guide research strategy at Toyota Motor Corporation. He directs research to create new tools and capabilities focused on improving the human condition through research in energy and materials, robotics, machine learning, and human-centric AI. So these, both of these folks have gigantic resumes. I'm gonna really trim it down for you and give you the highlights. Uh, but Dr. Pratt, in addition to being with Toyota, also has done some remarkable things when it comes to robots. He even owns some uh, patents as well. You've accomplished so much. Welcome, Dr. Pratt. Thank you very much, David. <laughs> We also have uh, Jill Blickstein, and, and listen to this title and, and the pressure that must come with it. American Airlines Chief Sustainability Officer. She's responsible for Americans' climate change strategy. So she's skilled in leading transformational projects, deep experience in public affairs and policy development, which you can see how those skills come in uh, very handy in doing her job. Uh, in addition to that, she used to be with J.P. Morgan Chase, and before that, she was Chief of Staff at the White House in the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, Jill Blixin, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. So, <clears throat> before we get into the Q&A and this, this kind of fireside chat that we have, I want to kind of set up the situation out there in my own humble reporter way. Uh, the last couple of years, I've been able to kind of dive into climate change, and I've been allowed to travel the world and kind of investigate what are the, some of the details that uh, some communities around the world are dealing with when it comes to climate. You've seen some of them, but I'll show you what I've experienced just to kind of put this stuff in a nutshell so we can get the conversation going. So why don't we kick things off, and we're going to show some video that I shot. Uh, this is the latter part of last year, and you might have heard about our... Uh, um, polar ice caps melting. Uh, go ahead and roll the video, everybody. And so what you'll see is, is this plane. That's JPL. They invited me to go with them to the six-year experiment up in Greenland, where they're measuring our polar ice caps. You might have heard the recent reports that say that our polar ice caps are melting at a faster rate than we ever thought possible. And it's these guys who figured that out. And what they found out was the ocean is heating up. And it's addition to the air, but the, actually the ocean water is becoming so hot, it's melting the ice from underneath. And as a result, it's, see that sheer cliff right there? That's about three to 400 feet tall. That's where the icebergs are breaking off and going into the ocean. But it's underneath that ice is where it's melting. And it's this 
particular research experiment that went six years in Greenland that helped us get a better understanding of that. But, and, and this is uh, Nuuk in Greenland, where they are very concerned about their homeland because the ocean is supposed to freeze over and they use sled dogs, but they can't do that anymore. And now I want to take you to Iceland. This is called Glacier Lagoon. It is beautiful. And you see those little icebergs that are floating out? These, those break off from that glacier over there. But what's remarkable is that beach that we were standing on, if it were World War II, we'd be under 2,000 feet of ice. But now that glacier has been reduced to the deepest and largest lake in all of Iceland. That's what that lagoon represents. But there is some good news. Here's an innovation. They call this orca. This is outside of Reykjavik in Iceland. This is like a giant vacuum. It's sucking in air and it purifies the air. It takes the carbon out. It takes tons of carbon out of our air every year. Granted, we'll need you know, millions of these to, 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 to help us, but at least it's innovation. And here's another innovation. This is near Fukushima, right here in Japan. You may have heard Japan is really pushing to really convert this country to hydrogen. That's what they would like to do. And this is a state-of-the-art facility where you can see all those solar panels that creates electricity, they take water, and they split it into hydrogen. It's a green process, and that hydrogen now is distributed. In this particular case, I shot this just prior to the Olympics last year, and they were using the hydrogen from this facility to uh, run Olympic Village, to run the vehicles that are delivering the athletes to the games, et cetera, and also the Olympic cauldron. This is one direction that we can consider, and we could even put it in our vehicles. So from this video, I want to get into the conversation with our experts. And uh, Gil, when we had the pre-talk, you said there are some, some details about carbon that are vitally important, in particular how long it lasts in our atmosphere. Tell us more about that and why it's important. Well, one of the, the very interesting things about carbon dioxide is that it actually uh, lasts decades, actually up to a century. And so the carbon that we emit today into the atmosphere is gonna be with us for a very, very long time. And of course, these vacuum cleaners, like you call them, or what it's technically called is direct air capture, is a way of trying to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But because even though it's going up, the concentration is so low, it takes enormous amounts of energy to do it. So it's far, far better not to emit it in the first place. And it's why we feel that we have to reduce CO2 emissions as much as possible, as soon as possible, because they're gonna be with us for a very, very long time. Yeah, it should be stated, there's no perfect solution. So there are all these ideas kind of out there floating around and, and, and people are, are thinking about and inventing new ones. But so far, there's nothing that's really sticking that we can say that's gonna save us. So, so that's why we have folks like you that are finding all the different possibilities. Now, Jill, uh, obviously the airline industry and the audio industry, you have similarities, but you also have some big differences. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that as we get into the conversation. So um, if I can put my, my wedge chart up maybe, I have, a, I have a chart that's about our strategy to get to net zero. And the, um, what's, what's interesting, so the difference between our, our industries, um, I'm very jealous of Gil because he has, he has technologies he can start to use today and in the next five years to really help decarbonize road transport. We don't have the technologies available in aviation that will actually help us. Go ahead and put the graphic up for Jill, guys. Okay. If, they don't, if they don't have it, that's fine. Um, so there, it, as we look to, to decarbonizing out to 2050, and we have a net zero goal, we don't really think aviation, by the way, can actually, oh, there it is, can actually decarbonize before 2050, because again, we don't have those technologies. So I'm not gonna, I won't go into this in too much detail, but if you look at the dark blue wedge and the medium blue wedge on here. So the dark blue wedge at the top, that's next generation propulsion, which if Gil is successful, hopefully we'll be able to get to, uh, and others, we'll be able to get to hydrogen propulsion on aircraft. And that will obviously take a lot of re-engineering of engines, but the, the, the work today is to uh, retrofit smaller jets first, like regional jets, uh, and then move up to, to, to the larger jets. But the thing that's, that's really interesting here that doesn't even exist today, well, that doesn't exist. The, the medium blue wedge where it says 40%, that's sustainable aviation fuel, what we call SAF. And you can buy a tiny little bit of it these days, uh, but we're, what we're trying to do is accelerate that market so that we can use essentially a renewable fuel in aircraft. And it's made today from waste fats and oils. So think like used cooking oil, for example. They actually go around to restaurants and collect used cooking oil. 
which sounds crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And it's actually a drop in fuel. When, when you take that, that fuel made from used cooking oil and you blend it 50-50 with conventional jet fuel, it can be dropped into existing aircraft, which is a little bit of magic, right? When you think about if you've flown out of LA or San Francisco in the last couple of years, you've been flying on a tiny little bit of renewable fuel. That's fantastic because it reduces emissions. But so you're, you're using it now. We're using it now, but in tiny, tiny amounts. And it, but I think the point being that that is one illustration of mm -hmm. SAF. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, SAF is sustainable aircraft. Aviation fuel. Aviation fuel. Yes. Okay, so that's one example of a possibility. But, but the problem is you don't really have a specific SAF to really rely on yet, right? Right. It's, it's a, more of a boutique product today. It's being made in tiny amounts, but we need policy and we need collaboration across lots of different sectors to really convert over. So for example, if Gill is successful and uh, road transport doesn't rely on diesel or ethanol anymore, we're going to use, we're going to be able to con convert the renewable diesel production in the U.S. to make SAF, and we're going to be able to use ethanol to make SAF using a special process. Well, well, why is it important if for Gil to not need it for you to be able to use it? Because, uh, so I'll just give the U.S. as an example. There's a lot of renewable diesel being made in the U.S. today. It uses the same inputs, the same feedstocks that we need for sustainable aviation fuel. But the producers make a lot of money making renewable diesel. When there's no market for renewable diesel, which I know Gil is looking forward to, <laughs> then we'll be able to use those feedstocks and kit that over and make SAF. Okay. So the hope is someday that somebody is going to be out there and is going to come up with something. I've, I've actually done stories off the coast of Los Angeles. They're growing kelp beds for fuel. And it's an experiment. Mm -hmm. But the reason they like kelp is because it's the fastest growing entity in the world. It can grow up to two feet a day. And they're thinking under the best conditions, they could create these kelp farms, harvest the kelp, and use, turn the kelp into some sort of an oil that becomes a fuel. I guess, is that an example of a possibility uh, yes. of what you guys all look for? Yeah, there's all different kinds of bio-based feedstocks like that. I mean, uh, so using waste fats and oils, I mean, there's, so for example, the, 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 sorry, the sap that we're buying today is actually made from beef tallow, mm -hmm. of all things. Right. But there's all kinds of waste fats and oils, and so that's an example. Uh, but one day we want to be able to, uh, we want the technologies to advance so that we're able to make SAF, for example, by pulling uh, carbon out of the air and using green hydrogen to make SAF. So the, the fans that you showed in your video, if we have a lot more direct air capture that's cheaper, we can then use that to help make SAF. Okay, just to get this straight, so we saw that it's called Orca, that one particular one is mm -hmm. called Orca. It sits right outside of Reykjavik. Mm -hmm. So this big contraption, it uses thermal power uh, from the earth because there's a lot of lava activity in Iceland. It uses thermal, so it's a clean energy that's always available there, and it creates this vacuum and it sucks the air in. And I think they get several tons of carbon out of the air, but then they have to dispose of that carbon. So what they do is they dig down deep and they put it underground, but what you're saying is maybe you can use that carbon mm -hmm. and turn it into fuel. Yes. Instead of them burying it, it could actually become something usable. That's great. So I think what's interesting though is between you two, mm. Like Gil is dealing with cars. So if it doesn't, if the fuel doesn't work in the car, you could pull it over to the side of the road. And an airplane, if it suddenly doesn't work, um, what's, it, what's gonna happen? So how is your dynamic different when it comes to kind of figuring it out, at least when it comes to uh, you know, the geography? He's on the ground and you're in the air. Well, why don't you talk about your... Well, let me um, maybe actually put up a slide. If you can put up my first slide, it shows some comparison here. And, uh, I hope the, the numbers are big enough that you can see them from wherever you are. But let's take a look at, for instance, gasoline versus hydrogen versus the lithium that's inside of lithium ion batteries. So the first column that's to the right of the labels is uh, what we call um, energy per mass. How much energy does a certain amount of mass, or if you want to think about it as weight, actually have? How many kilowatt hours per kilogram? And if you look at gasoline, uh, the number is pretty high, 13.2 kilowatt hours of energy per kilogram of mass. Hydrogen is actually even more because hydrogen is a very light molecule, but it's a chemical fuel. How about those lithium ion batteries in uh, battery electric cars? They're way, way down there at 0 0.3. So what does that mean? Each kilogram of a battery actually has very little energy inside of it, and as a result, the, Battery electric cars are very heavy uh -huh. in order to have the equivalent amount of energy inside of them. 
But we have a wonderful thing in the automotive business that unfortunately Jill doesn't have, which is an old invention, the wheel. <laughs> Wheels are wonderful because you can carry heavy things on the ground. And actually, electric cars tend to have high pressure tires with special rubber compounds that uh, don't lose very much uh, energy when they roll. So the rolling resistance is low. Unfortunately, in a plane, that's not really practical. So that's one of the big differences that are there. Um, if I can go on just a little bit here, uh, there's other columns here. The next one over is how much energy do you get for a certain volume? And there, there are differences, and gasoline is actually the best, uh, but it's not as radical of a difference as you see with weight, with mass. And then if I can skip all the way over to the second to the right-hand one, um, you'll see why hydrogen is so appealing. And this has to do with zero to full refueling time. How many minutes does it take to refuel a vehicle with different types of energy sources? Uh, the first one is gasoline. We all know that uh, if you're... Uh, you know, fueling at a gas pump, it's a couple minutes to refuel. If you happen to race cars on the track, it's really fast because they go whoosh and it just all kind of goes in. Uh, but hydrogen is also pretty fast, not quite as fast as gas, but uh, only a couple minutes. For a lithium ion battery, it takes much longer. Even on a supercharger, it takes quite a long time. And so the way that electric vehicles have to be recharged is different. And uh, that'll lead into to something else that uh, I think is very worthwhile discussing, which harkens all the way back to the first talk that we heard here, having to do with the advantage of diversity, which is picking different approaches uh, so that different ones can work in different circumstances. Can I uh, dissect this just a little bit? So getting back to the question between cars and planes, basically by that first column, you're saying batteries may be too heavy for planes we're probably not going to get electric planes. You're, you're seeing a lot out there in the industry about something you may have heard called EVATOL, which is electric vertical takeoff and lift. So there's, there will probably, it looks like there, there, there's a lot of good developments around um, essentially getting an electric, a zero emissions electric helicopter off the ground. Um, there are very small planes that can use batteries, but I think, I think Gil's point is that the, the batteries would have to be so large on a plane that it would just become essentially a tanker. It never gets off the ground. So that's why our focus is on hydrogen, is on, is on SAF and getting to 100% SAF. Right now we have to blend it, but getting to 100% SAF, and then eventually getting to hydrogen propulsion. And so at American, we have recently invested in, in two, hydro, two, two startups that are working on different aspects of how to get hydrogen into aircraft. One is trying to create a, called Zero Avia, is working to create uh, a hydrogen powertrain for a, for a small regional jet. And the other, called Universal Hydrogen, is trying to figure out how are we going to create a hydrogen infrastructure. You know, we, we can't go around and create, we can't replicate the existing ga, uh, jet fuel infrastructure that has pipelines and that gets fuel all over the, all over the world. Uh, so they're working on essentially capsules that can be more easily transported and get to airports. Uh, and, then it, and then it's easier then to, to swap them out on aircraft. So the bottom line is hydrogen is still promising. Mm -hmm. It could be a solution in the future. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we are. We just right. got to figure out a lot of other details when it comes to hydrogen. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the issues is, uh, so at American, I think, I believe we burn more, we use more jet fuel than really any other entity in the world, like even more than the US military. In, in 2019, pre-COVID, well, you're the, the world's biggest airline. Is we're the world's the biggest airline because of that. Exactly, we we use about four and a half billion gallons of fuel. Hmm. So uh, in 20 in 20 last year, we actually used 1.4 million gallons of SAF. So when I, when I say that SAF is a tiny piece, like it's a very tiny piece of the total fuel. But we in 2019, I think our emissions were were 40 million tons of CO2. It's a hmm. lot and. Uh, so for, for us to really get to be able to replace that with these zero emissions uh, technologies, it means that we're going to be using a pretty big share of the world's renewable electricity. Oh, okay. So the more solar we get, the more wind we get, that's great, but we, we are going to put a, a strain on that. Right. Gil, so many questions for you. Mm. You know, we all drive cars, so we're more familiar with this territory. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm on my third electric car, and I thought I was saving the world. But now suddenly there's all this new information about how batteries are made, how the carbon that that process creates, how do you get rid of a battery when it's seen its day, and the fact that maybe we're not helping the world by driving an electric car. We're actually, and sometimes we're plugging into a grid that runs on coal and oil. 
So we might be polluting the car by just plugging it in. So there's a lot of questions when it comes to that, and, you, and I'm sure you hear this a million times. So what should we do? What's the best option for all of us? So um, the real answer is that it depends. And I'll go to my next slide here, uh, which really illustrates this. Uh, this is a, a chart that's a result of some peer-reviewed and open source work that we can put. You can look at it yourself at cargh.org. Uh, the x-axis here is the uh, amount of uh, carbon dioxide emissions over the lifetime of a car, assuming that it lasts for 150,000 miles. And because we're uh, very careful to not criticize uh, other OEMs, uh, the cars that you see identified are only the ones that Toyota makes, but the other ones there, depending on their color, are cars uh, that are representative that come from other manufacturers. The y-axis is an idea of the cost of the vehicle, total operating expense, including the purchase of the car and the maintenance, all of that stuff. And the time period we pick is um, somewhat arbitrary uh, of five years. We can change the scale to be whatever you'd like to be. What you'll notice here is uh, different kinds of cars. PHEV stands for Plug-in Hybrid Electric Vehicle. Uh, hybrid, I think you all know, uh, it runs on uh, gasoline fuel, but it also has an electrical system inside that makes it much more uh, efficient than uh, a pure internal combustion engine car. And then just for reference, we have the Cor Corolla uh, internal combustion engine on the right-hand side. Uh, the blue circles that you see there, uh, at the time that we made this, we were not selling a uh, battery electric vehicle, but we actually are doing so now. Uh, those all represent battery electric vehicles that other manufacturers are making. You'll notice that in this particular picture, sure, the, the blue dots, the battery electric vehicles, tend to be towards the left-hand side. So they are, in fact, good for the environment. You were, in fact, doing a good thing. Uh, but this chart is for the United States. In other parts of the world that generate their uh, electrical power to recharge the cars and emitting much more CO2 because they're not using natural gas plants, they're using coal plants, things like that, this chart is quite different and things move around quite a bit. But what you'll also see in this chart is that these vehicles are actually quite close to each other. And the reason is, is that the creation of this large battery that's inside the battery electric vehicle emits a lot of carbon. And so it's sort of like we're making an investment when we make each one of those battery cells, putting CO2 into the atmosphere, hoping that the battery cell over its lifetime will pay that back and save us more CO2 than we put out when we made it. And exactly how that balance works out is different for different parts of the world and for different kinds of cars. So the, the net result of all this is that we believe very, very strongly in this idea of diversity, that there are diverse uh, circumstances in different parts of the world with power generation, just like you said. Uh, and so we need diverse answers to suit those different parts of the world. There's also a diversity of us as human beings. Uh, some people are wealthy, most people are not. Some people live in a city, some people live in other parts. And it will drastically change what's practical for the person. So one size doesn't fit all, and we feel that this chart helps us say that if we can find a low or zero carbon uh, answer for every single person, no matter what their circumstance are, is, and no matter what the uh, part of the world that they live in is, then we'll actually save more carbon overall by allowing each person to contribute as much as possible. So just to clarify, the battery situation, you know, when we were being told that it takes a ton of carbon to create a battery, you're confirming that's true. Yeah. But you say, if you drive that battery quite a bit, in a way we kind of make up for that carbon. But what if you don't drive a lot? Well, that's, that's the problem. And so uh, as an example, despite me being an executive in Toyota, I actually own a Tesla Model X. Uh, <laughs> don't tell anybody, though. <laughs> uh, don't tell anybody. I'm sure the secret is good here. I know there's a couple reporters. Uh, but actually, the, the reason is because the chief engineer for that car was a very good colleague of mine uh, when we were at MIT. And so uh, I spoke to him, and he was very proud of the work that he did. So we, we have that car, but if you look at it, that particular car, let me sort of show you a uh, picture here, has a battery in it that's good for around 500 kilometers of range. Now, it turns out that the world uh, supply of lithium is quite limited, 
And so what that means is that we're gonna have a big crisis. The prices now of uh, lithium are extremely high. It's gonna get even worse. So in the next five to 10 years, there's gonna be this great shortage of lithium for making lithium ion batteries for battery electric vehicles. So the left hand one there, that's my Tesla Model X. The one on the right, I have a second car that comes from my uh, company. Uh, it's a RAV4 Prime. We can make eight of those with a 60 kilometer range on the battery um, for each one of the Tesla Model Xs in terms of the net battery supply that there is. That means less CO2 put into the air for each one of those cars that we manufacture. And it also means that we're using that precious investment in making those uh, batteries much more because the ones on the right will actually get used much more all of the time. And those cars are sized so that they're significantly over, but not excessively over, the average round trip commute for a person in a day. So if you recharge your car each night, the answer on the right, and I'll click one last click here, actually results in eight times the carbon reduction than the answer on the left. Now, does this mean that this is the right answer forever? No, because in the future, there'll be plenty of lithium there won't be a bottleneck on the number of batteries we have, and so we'll be able to go much more to the answer on the left-hand side. And in fact, we are already having a target that in only eight years, we're gonna be producing 35% of our global output will actually be the answer on the left-hand side. But 35% is not 100, and so we think that we need to make a bunch of the ones on the right also for more CO2 uh, emission reduction. So just to bottom line this, if my, my drive to work is seven miles, and I'm driving somewhere between 15 and 20 miles a day, a hybrid is probably better for me to go with environmentally than an electric car. Presently, that's true. I think that in the future, uh, circumstances will change. And so the thing about diversity is that there's diversity in space, which is you know all the different geographies in the world and how power is made, but there's gonna be this diversity in time. The best answer now, it's very much the same as the chart that Jill showed, which had time on the X, uh, axis. It was clear that the best strategy now is different than the best strategy in the future. Mm -hmm. And something that's like incredibly difficult to grasp, but very important, there's tremendous uncertainty of what's gonna happen in the future. We all think that we can predict the future, uh, but sadly, it's not actually true. And so if we have diverse possibilities now, it allows us to adapt easily to however the future works itself out. How is SAF going to be made? Well, we, we want to use it too, not as a sustainable aviation fuel, but a sustainable ground vehicle fuel ourselves also because of all of the uh, cars in operation, the used cars that are still going to be with us for a very long time. We have to solve that issue also, very much the same issue that Jill has to solve, and we don't know how we're going to do it. So having a diversity of approaches allows us to adapt. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time. Uh, there's so much more. I wanted to kind of get into the hydrogen conversation, et cetera, et cetera. We just don't have time to do that. But I, I did want to get uh, some remarks from both of you, just kind of going into the future, because you're, you're both on the front lines. So you have a lot of responsibility. You're trying to make, you know, you're, going to try, you're trying to turn this giant train that's going in one direction around and, and go the other direction. So you see the difficulty and the hurdles that lie ahead. Do you remain optimistic? I mean, we are getting hit with giant storms, wildfires. Our wine is at risk. Winemakers are really struggling with climate change. How do you regard your approach to the Earth today? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Jill. I'm an optimist. Uh... You know, it's funny, every day I have to tell this story about how we actually don't have the means today to actually reduce our emissions. But I see so much, I see so much acceleration and so much, I see so much happening uh, much more quickly than I imagined. So for example, it's a little thing. Like in, in the United States, of course, we just passed a big uh, climate change bill. You know, and everyone had told me, oh, there's no way you're going to get a SAF tax credit. You're not, you're, there's no way you're going to get an incentive to grow the market for SAF in there. And I was told up and down it wasn't going to happen. And lo and behold, at the last minute, it happened. And it was just this sign that, like, I think the stars are aligning. Uh, and, the, and, and we're seeing so much more investment in the science. Uh, you know, Toyota's commitment is, mm -hmm. is, pretty, is pretty remarkable through the work that Gil does. And uh, you know, we don't make planes and we don't make gas, but we, we are seeing from uh, Boeing and others, we're seeing this great investment. And so I, I do have hope, as, even as we're sort of hanging on there and, and waiting, but yes. Gil, how about you? 
So uh, I'm very much like Jill, uh, and it's not only because our names are so close. Exactly. And, uh, people in Japan <laughs> pronounce them basically the same. <laughs> but um, I am an optimist because necessity is the mother of invention. And it has always been this way. And actually, what seems to be happening, both in that wonderful film that you showed, um, is that the weather seems to be changing even more quickly than was anticipated as a result of climate change. And many people get very anxious about this and think that it's a bad thing. Uh, I actually think that it's a good thing. And the reason is, is that it's uh, making us alarmed and it's getting people to you know, stop pretending that somehow this problem isn't as serious as it is. It's extraordinarily serious. And having the weather sort of signal to us in this unequivocal way, you know, I woke up uh, a few years ago in California, the sky was orange from the smoke from wildfires that we had there. And that had not happened before. And it's just getting worse and worse. I was at the Hoover Dam. Lake Mead is almost at the bottom, right? You just see it all of the time. And so I am certain that we will figure out the answer. I don't know how we're gonna figure it out. I don't know exactly which answer it will be. That's why we're doing the research and we're investing billions of dollars to try to figure it out. Uh, but I am confident that we're going to do that. And uh, in addition, hard times bring out this wonderful characteristic. It's yet another wonderful thing about Japan that I admire so much, which is this perseverance. You know, No matter how bad things get, you persevere and you push through. And actually, I think it's one of the gifts that Japan has given to the world, which was this philosophy that you just keep on trying until finally you are going to get the answer. And so I'm certain that it's going to happen, but I'm not certain which of them it will be, which is why we need to keep on trying all the different ways. A beautiful note. Thank you so much. Gil, Jill, we appreciate you guys being on the front lines and helping us out. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all.